Welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast, a production from Empowering Pumps and Equipment as the voice of the pump and related equipment industry. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 63 of the Empowering Industry Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Bethany Womack, and I'm joined by my co-host, Becca Mechnensheimer. Uh, for one, did I say your last name correctly? Yes, you did. Good job. <laughs> and two, uh, you're going to be with us for a little while filling in for Charlie while she's healing. So I wanted to take a minute for you to introduce yourself. And then I also want you to introduce everyone to your co-hosts that will be tagging along every time you record this podcast. Awesome. Well, yes, I'm Becca. Um, I am the director of Empowering Pumps and Equipment. So really, I work every day with our clients to help them with their marketing and getting their name out there to our um, large audience. And uh, so my my co-host, uh, co-host to the co-host is yeah. Woodrow. So this is Woodrow. <laughs> he is a miniature dachshund. <laughs> uh, he is not happy because he was sleeping, uh, but he is going to be probably on my lap almost every episode, uh, snoozing because he is codependent. (laughs) Lovely. And so if you're listening to just the audio version of this, definitely at least go and click on the YouTube link so you can see Woodrow. He's not going to disappoint. He's also like our pump talk pup. If you ever see promos for empowering pumps that has a pup that has like some beautifully designed background with it, that's Woodrow. Um, I love him. Uh, do I like him more than my dogs? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Who doesn't like a wiener dog? I mean, come on. <laughs> um, okay. So we're, we're here. We're really excited that all of our listeners are here with us. Give us a rating and review. Uh, let Becca know that you are happy that she's here. You can tag her on social media, uh, tag us on social media, and tag Charlie to let her know that you're thinking about her and that um, you know, everyone's here supporting her. So this show, like we do every week, we're going to cover some social media, something from social media, uh, preview the news from empowering pumps and equipment and connect you with an industry influencer. And we always start out with something a little personal. Um, so I'm going to let you go first, Becca, and tell everyone how your week was. Thank you, Bethany. So my week was good. I was coming off of a high from being in Chicago for Empowering Women. And then before that, I was in Sandbridge, Virginia with my partner and his family. So it was a really nice trip to kind of get the beach and have some relaxation time. But I did bring my computer and made sure to to check emails in the morning. And I'm not going to lie, I, I won't do working vacations very often just because I yeah. I know I need to unplug. But it was so nice coming back on Monday and not having, you know, hundreds of emails to go through. So that was really good. Yeah. Uh, but how was your week? Um, in the same vein, I feel like I, you know, just got home from a long trip. We did a little personal vacay at the front end and then Chicago uh, at the end. In last week's episode, Charlie and I were recording together in Chicago. And so if you listen to that, uh, you definitely know that we were on a high just from being together. It was so good to see you, Becca, and see everyone else. Um, and then, you know, you come home and it, I was really excited to be home and be home in my own bed. And, and it just felt very, um, like a busy week. I was telling you earlier before we recorded that I, I didn't give myself enough reset time between coming home and then starting work again on Monday. Um, so I am very much looking forward to this long weekend that's coming up. Uh, yeah. So if you're listening to this, I hope you had a great 4th of July. Uh, I, plan on sleeping a lot. So that's what I'm going to do. Good Um, plan. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and get social. This is where we're going to share something with you that you need to know that I've seen on social media or something that you need to know about social media. Um, But first we have our meetups. So Becca, tell everybody when they can join us. Yes. So we always want to invite you to our virtual meetups. And next week we have Empowering Women, which is Wednesday or two weeks. Sorry. Empowering Women is Wednesday, July 14th. It's always the second Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m. Central Time. And then our Empowering Brands meetup 
is July 20th, every third Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, on the Empowering Women call, we're actually going to be joined by a speaker um, who's also going to be presenting at Empowering Women. His name is Daryl Stinson. He's a dynamic two-time TEDx speaker, a former D1 athlete, and a best-selling author. And he just has um, a really unique story. He's a really amazing guy who talks about, you know, mental health and being his most authentic self. And he's going to be talking to us on our Empowering Women call about how to grow your business with public speaking, uh, which I think, you know, I don't want to project or paint with a broad brush here, but I think a lot of women especially, uh, we have a hard time... uh, talking about ourselves and promoting our business and speaking with as much confidence as we should because we're uh, empowering successful women. And so I'm really excited to have him on that call. Um, For both calls, you need to make sure you sign up for the event. The link is in the show notes so you can be emailed the Zoom link. And we want to give you a shout out. So reach out to us on social media. You can give us a shout out on the show and stay connected at Empowering Pumps and using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast. Awesome. Okay, Becca, I'm very excited that you are here because I've been waiting to talk about um, some content that you created for Empowering Brands, Empowering Women, all of our things. Um, But I wanted to wait till you were on the show and now you're here. So a while back, you created a three video series about self-care and how you do self-care and why it's important to you. And so over the next three weeks on the podcast, we're going to be covering those three videos that you made. And I'll also include the link to the video. So if you really like this chat, um, go and actually watch the video and you'll get an even further in-depth view of it. But Becca, you're our self-care queen and, uh, I love like the changes that I've implemented because of your advice and I'm excited to share it here with our listeners. So why don't we just start by you telling us like why you're such a self-care advocate, why it's important to you. Um, So it's important to me because I need it for myself. (laughs) Um, Really, I, I dived into it whenever I realized that I just wasn't giving myself the time that I needed to be successful and to grow and to be happy. Um, So that's really when I kind of just dove right into it and realized that I wasn't the only one. Um, So really self-care, you know, it's important because it's about prioritizing ourselves. And it's what I have found is the best tool to be able to grow and become a better version of ourselves and who we really want to be, um, our authentic selves. And, you know, I really wanted to be able to share that with our audience and to be able to implement self-care practices that lead us to where we want to go and to learn that self-care isn't just about treating yourself. Um, Not that treating yourself is not um, (laughs) fun and uh, does, you know, help you feel good sometimes, but it's so much more than that. and, And there's a lot that goes into it that can really benefit us. I laugh because every time, um, Every time I talk about self-care and Charlie's talking with me, she loves to remind everyone that you are the reason that she drinks water, that like you joined the team and you came to a trade show and you were like, Charlie, you haven't drank any water today. Um, You need to take better care of yourself and just drink some water and be healthy. And uh, so I think of you a lot when I'm working and I drink water and when I implement these self-care things. So thank you. Uh, All the listeners go grab some water and drink it. You'll feel better. Um, okay. So the, sorry, here we go. Um, your videos that you created, like I said, they're in three main parts. So you cover mind, body, and soul. Today, we're going to start with mind. It's the first video you put out and it really focuses on uh, mental health and how that impacts self-care as a whole. Um, and I really think when you like people sometimes think about, um, self-care as like, um, going to a spa or um, working out, but don't always incorporate their mental health as an aspect of it. But it's really so important because you can be very healthy. You can be a D1 athlete. You can um, go to a spa for a week, but you cannot separate yourself from your mental thoughts um, and your mental health. And so I think focusing on that as part of uh, self-care is so important. 
Absolutely. And, you know, self-care can look like a lot of things when it comes to mental health. Um, it can be therapy. It can be meant, um, meditation, journaling, reading, gardening. Um, really, it's just figuring out something that helps you um, calm your mind and um, just look at things a little bit different and not be, you know, stuck in all the the craziness. Um you know, and trying, trying different things. So seeing what is right for you. For me, therapy is my number one self-care practice when it comes to my mental health. And I don't necessarily, you know, need to be seeing my therapist every single week, but I love to, because even if I don't have something like pressing, that's really bothering me that I want to work through, just having her to talk to is just helpful. So same with, you know, you have a friend that you're able to, to really talk through the things of your day to day or things you're struggling with. It, it always makes you feel better after you have that conversation and therapy is just that. Um, so that that's one of the things that has been critical for me and my self care, same with journaling, but it really is personal to you and figuring out what that thing or things um, are that really help you personally. And, you know, and sometimes it changes, right? Like I've noticed in myself, you know, there's periods of my life where like therapy was very helpful. And then, you know, I get to a different place where I feel like it's, you know, I'm not getting as much out of therapy. And so then I, I look at my, my toolbox of tools that help, you know, and so like I start doing like meditation or whatever. And so like at different stages, sometimes different things I think work for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, what worked last year might not work right now. So try different things for sure. Exactly. And even so another example of that is, you know, with journaling, that's something that I do, but depending on, you know, if I'm really busy at work or if I'm just super stressed, I can't get in the mind, like the mental state to sit down and be intentional and journal. Um, and it's okay to take a break. It's okay to allow yourself time to, not do the things that you know are helpful for you. It's just important that you don't get stuck and that you get back into those things. And if it does change, then just making sure that you pick something else that is going to be helpful for you when it comes to self-care and specifically mental health. Okay. So also in your video, like in this first video about mind, you talk about the three big tools that you use to help with your mental health. Um, and my hope is that the audience listens to these. And if they're struggling one day, they can pick from one of these tools and try it out. And hopefully it works well for them. So first up, um, and you've talked about it a little already, but I just want you to elaborate a little um, about therapy and why it's such an important tool for your mental health. Absolutely. And you know, there's still a lot of stigma, I think, that is around therapy, which is why I'm very open about myself going to therapy. Um, you know, when people say, oh, I go to therapy, it, it must mean there's something wrong with you. Uh, and that's not the case at all. You don't have to have some, you know, major life event to benefit from going to therapy. And, you know, and if you do, then certainly like go to therapy, please. But um, it, it still is stigmatized <laughs> that therapy means that you must have something wrong with you or something, you know, tragic happened. And, and while, yes, yeah, sometimes that is the case, there is a lot of um, room to be able to utilize it for other things, to just talk to somebody, to have somebody that's there to listen to you, even if it's nothing that, you know, other people would deem important. It's still important to you and to have that is, is very helpful. Um, so yeah, therapy. And there's a lot of tools, I think, to help connect you with a therapist. Um, I'm definitely going to include the Psychology Today link in the show notes. Um, that's the one I used where you just, you can put your search parameters, whether you're looking for in-person or virtual, you can put in your insurance or whether your cash pay in it, like, will give you some of the best recommendations. And Becca, if you have any other um, links or resources for how to find a therapist, we can definitely include those. So the only thing that I would additionally note is, is you do have to like be intentional. Just don't like find the closest person to you, like yeah. research the ones that are in your area and then actually like look at who they are, what they believe in, um, and making sure that it's aligned. So with me, anytime that I have gone to therapy as an adult, like I am intentional with who I'm going to spend that time with. 
and use to, to help me and making sure that it is someone that resonates with me and that I have a connection just from reading, you know, what they're passionate yeah. about and the things that they help people with. So that's, that's really my tip of therapy is making sure that you do understand who that person is before you just start going to them. And then even if you think they would be a good fit and you start going to them and they're not, you don't really feel like you're connecting with them and it's okay to find a new therapist. 100%. I definitely agree. Um, and I will validate, even though that is hard, you deserve it. So um, definitely find one that works for you. The second tool you were talking about is journaling. And you talked about this a lot and how you really like it. And basically, it's just what it sounds like. It's, you know, writing your thoughts. And it's, um, I like to use the example, if you've ever been really mad, and you typed out an email to someone, and then you get to the end, and you're like, I feel better. I don't really need to send it. Um, I just wrote out all my thoughts and now it's out and I feel better. So journaling can be that same outlet for you. And then there's also um, different programs where you can get prompts. I know that we got a journal deck from one of Becca's friends who actually puts that together where it's like every day you pull a card and it says like, you know, write about uh, what made you happy or, you know, it gives you different prompts um, to help you really discover your feelings um, because even as an adult, all of my years of, you know, naming my feelings, uh, sometimes it still is hard for me to, de to really decide what's really making me upset. And a lot of times journaling and writing can just help you connect with that place inside. Yes. And um, the third thing is, you know, mental health days and practicing our no. So it's important to rest your mind when it's tired not just your body. Like we understand when our bodies, like we know when our bodies are tired and not that we don't know when our minds are tired, but we don't really feel validated in the fact that we need to rest our minds. And, you know, it's I think okay. we're much slower to admit that, you know, that our minds are tired than we are to admit that our body is tired because it's, yes. you can't see it as easily. I think. Yes, I agree. 100%. And so, you know, when you feel burnout, it's important to take a break. You know, whether it's um, taking a couple breaks throughout the day or making sure that you take that lunch break, like your scheduled lunch break, or, you know, a little bit of time in the morning that's just for you, making sure that you are taking care of your mental health and taking that time to rest your mind and give yourself, you know, what it needs, which is a lot of yeah. time, just some rest. And my favorite is the practicing our no. Um, so saying no to things that you don't want to do. Yes, we're all adults. We have to do things that we don't want to do. But it's okay to say no as well. If you are overwhelmed and you have a lot of things on your plate, it's okay to say no. So give yourself permission to, to do that. And, you know, yes, occasionally you're going to come into a situation where someone does not like that you uh, set a boundary and said no. But that's not what's important. What's important is you and your self-care. And if saying no just really feels like too much, then say no. <laughs> say no. Yeah. Place the boundary and do what's best for yourself. Uh, and, you know, you can practice that. Have a friend ask you if you want to go to dinner and then tell them no. Like tell them that your whole reason is that you're rehearsing saying no to people. And maybe that isn't an issue for all of our listeners. It is for me. So I appreciated that tip when I watched the video. Um, to wrap everything up here on this first video of the three-part series, um, taking care of your mind is really just a vital part of self-care. And if you, if this resonated with you and you want to learn more and hear more about Becca's tips, definitely watch the video. It goes into a little bit more, um, just explanation on all of these things and a few more tips. Um, so the link will be in the show notes for that. Becca, was there anything else that you wanted to add before we move on? Really that self-care is about watering yourself and making you a so priority. Good. So we're plants, essentially. <laughs> Just give us some water. We need some water. Um, but uh, it's so much more than what people realized in terms of, you know, prioritizing ourselves and being able to give ourselves some time, love, and care. Um, it's so important. And, you know, I, I do think that people do still poo-poo the idea of self-care of, you know, it's just a bubble bath. It's just 
treating yourself out shopping. Like it's not, it can be, but yeah. there are so many other parts of self-care that are so much more um, beneficial and like nurturing to who you are as a person. And to tie this into industry, if anyone stuck through this whole thing and has been like, why are we talking about self-care? It's a pump podcast. Well, it's because to be the best version of yourself, to be the most productive at work, to, you know, connect with your clients the most and, and solve that new problem, you need to be the best version of yourself and you need to take care of yourself and take care of your mind. And if you're depleted and you haven't been watering yourself, you're not going to make any fruit for anyone else. So um, that's how this ties into industry. Uh, go and tell your boss, Becca said, drink some water <laughs> is basically <laughs> what we're saying. Um, okay. So we're going to move into the news. Um, this is where we're going to preview some news that you're going to see later this week in your inbox in the Empowering Pumps and Equipment newsletter, where you start every week with the person of the week. And this week, it's RJ Russell, the president of Russell Industrial Group. Uh, he's a really cool guy. He got his start on a summer internship, and I loved this part because he said he just took it to get experience, and he probably couldn't even tell you what a pump looked like when he started that internship, which I resonated with a lot. I feel like that's how I started my career, maybe not on an internship, but I definitely couldn't have told you what any of these uh, machines were or related equipment. Um, but then nine years later, he decided to start his own business, and he really just wants new engineers coming in know, to know that they need to, you know, get their hands dirty and just get out there and get some field experience and a really cool guy. Definitely check out his profile. So you can check out um, the industry person of the week feature on the site and nominate someone, you know, so we love putting a spotlight on people in the industry. So please go to our website, nominate someone that's doing awesome work and let us put the spotlight on them and, you know, promote the heck out of them. Yes. So in the news, we have a white paper from Birder. So this is 10 essentials for selecting a double diaphragm pump. In almost all factories, you can find at least a couple AODD pumps. Not always in the heart of the process and maybe not very visible, but they're doing their job reliably day after day. So selecting the right pump can be complicated, but really not as much as you may think. So, you know, you have to keep in mind in some important parameters, uh, fluid property, flow, temperature, pressure. Um, you can download this white paper and read about it on our website. Again, 10 essentials for selecting a double diaphragm pump. And it's a really great um, list of things you need. Uh, I love that. I feel like that's self-care for the plant that you're working on because that pump is doing its job. No one even notices it. It's just there in the background doing its job and you got to take care of it for sure. Um, the news article I'm sharing comes to us from CF Turbo. They just launched a major software update. So having the freedom to create and push the limits of design is a key conceptual design um, simulation and optimization of pumps, blowers, fans, compressors, and turbines. Um, that's really key for anyone working in turbo machinery. Um, and with their new software release, all of this is possible um, for designers with any level of expertise, which I think is uh, a really neat feature of this, that you could be new in the industry and not have all of that knowledge and still benefit from probably even more so from their software release. The new release features a wide range of enhancements and add-ons to current modules, um, like an all-new compressor module, a more flexible blade profile design methodolo methodology, um, and improvements on their 3D modeling and more. So CF Turbo does release two major software versions each year. It's one of the things that really sets them apart. And so if you work with turbo machinery or any of its key components, I think this um, article is definitely worth a read so you can check out what new features are available on their software. And with that, um, we're going to move into our industry interview. Everyone, Charlie's back. You're going to get to hear her talk on the podcast. Uh, she 
has a really good interview for us today um, and has them actually scheduled out through the end of August, so you're not going to miss her. Um, but today, for your interview, you have Steve Bodich, the Global Market Development Manager at Chesterton. Um, he's worked for AW Chesterton Company for over 30 years in all facets of ARC codings. He has 35 plus years involvement in the codings industry, including specifying, developing, and supporting protective codings technologies. He's held positions in application engineering, research development, and marketing uh, before he became the director of product line management. He's a really interesting person, and I'm really thinking you're going to like this interview. I'm also really looking forward to hearing the interview, especially because it's Chesterton and they're one of our partners and we love our partners. So without further yes. delay, here is the interview. All right. Well, Steve, welcome to the Empowering Industry Podcast. I'm so happy to have you on here. I feel like I haven't seen you in forever, so this That's is really long. nice. Yep. Um, well, let's start by just telling our listeners kind of who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Steve Bowditch, and I am the Global Product Line Director for Chesterton's line of industrial coatings under the ARC brand. Uh, I've been at Chesterton 33 years. Um, and my role as product line director is really to manage the product line from an engineering as well as a P&L standpoint. So I manage all of our engineering projects. I manage our sales to the field from a marketing perspective. And I support our products from a technical uh, as well as a commercial perspective. Well, one of my questions was just, you know, how'd you get into the industry? And then why'd you stay around? So 33 <laughs> years, that's something to be proud of. It's a, I got into the industry in the most backhanded way you could imagine. Um, my actual, my undergraduate degree, uh, my first undergraduate degree was in the field of classics. So I was a, I read Latin, I read Greek. I was involved in archaeological digs all over Europe and the Middle East. And one of the projects in my grad That's amazing. One of my projects in grad school got me involved working with a chemist from Switzerland who was from Siba Geige Corporation. And he was developing an adhesive that they would use on Trajan's column in Rome. And the adhesive had to be resistant to the sulfur dioxide gases coming off of the automobiles that was destroying all the limestone artifacts in the city, all the antiquities. So we developed these coatings, because until then, when I was in, in uh, at the American Academy in 1977, the all of the Roman antiquities, Trajan's Column, uh, most of the Trevi Fountain was just encased in green plastic wrap. So it, it looked like a big crystal exhibit, except it was in green plastic wrap, not in you know bright, vibrant colors. And yeah. But that's right. It doesn't look like that now. <laughs> yeah. So now what, what we did, we developed this adhesive and this uh, coating system that would protect the antiquities. And I sort of became fascinated by that and came back and, and pursued that in my graduate degree, which was in antiquities and restoration technology. And I actually graduated with my master's from UMass uh, in antiquities and archaeological restoration and had an internship in the Seattle Museum of Fine Art, where I was working on ancient Japanese ceramics. And my internship, the money petered out after three months, and so I had to go find a job. So using my summer career as a sandblaster at the Todd Shipyard, I went down to the Todd Shipyard and said, can you hire me full time as a painter? I got hired on as a painter. Uh, and from there, I ran into a guy from a company called Seal Coat, which is an old coating company. I'm not even sure if they're still around as a brand. And this guy said, you're way too smart to be, you know, holding the, you know, holding the paint nozzle or a blast nozzle. So you need to get out in the field and do more activity. So he convinced me to go to work for him. Uh, that was in 1981. Uh, and I then went through a series of, well, it was about five years of traveling all over the Pacific Rim from, oh, I was far down as Peru all the way over to Korea, and I was just doing paint projects. It was offshore platforms, Valdez pipeline, uh, nuclear power plants, and I was a coatings inspector and coating supervisor. So, 
So did you just like the you know element of it that it's that it's covering something that it can make something last more? Like what what you know made you love it? Well, really, it was my curiosity. Uh, I'm a curious person by nature, and um, the nice thing about coatings is they're visible. In most instances, they're quite visible. Uh, so if they're external, you're going to see them. You, you know, you're going to drive by a, 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 a tank farm, you're going to see storage tanks. They're all painted a beautiful color. We are responsible for that. So there's pride in seeing your workmanship. But there's also, I really enjoyed uh, the industrial aspect of it. I became very intrigued with industrial processes. So I would go into a, a, an oil refinery and I would learn everything about how oil was refined so I could figure out where these coatings could be used. And then I would do the same thing in a power plant and the same thing in a paper mill and the same thing in a wastewater treatment plant. So I became a general, a general practitioner of protective coatings. And I understood the industries where the coatings would be used. I understood the applications where the coatings could be used. And I understand the types of coatings that would be used. So it was really a, a blending together of my chemical background and my artistic background and then my natural curiosity of understanding plant processes. So I think that to me is the most exciting job. I can come in and I never know day to day what kind of off the wall application is gonna come at me. To me, I mean, a pump application is one of the easiest applications because it involves you know, relatively- Yeah, well, let's talk about that. Place. I think people, yeah, well, I was going to say, let's let's talk about that. I know our audience understands this. So, you know, what do we need to know about coatings um, in the pump industry? Well, um, the first thing is, is that coatings is just one tool that can be used by a reliability engineer or a maintenance person who is trying to provide some kind of asset preservation approach. Um, there's always going to be mechanical work done to the pump, you know, whether that's new set of wear rings or trimming an impeller or whatever. You're, there's going to, always going to be some level of mechanical repairs to the pump required. Um, what I find is that in most instances, when a pump is disassembled and is under maintenance, there is no better time to integrate a protective coating at that point. Um, most of your labor is tied up in the tear down and inspection of the pump. Blasting and coating a pump depending upon the complexity of the pump can be relatively simple. There are certain pumps that are highly engineered, you know, liquid ring vacuum pumps, completely different from a, a vertical turbine pump. Clearances are much tall, much tighter um, and, and operating conditions are much more severe inside of a, a, a liquid ring vacuum pump. But for most part, for the most part, um, a pump coating just has to survive with the pump operational parameters and you can characterize them. You know, obviously we char I would characterize a feed water pump to a power plant as a different class of pump than say a circulating water pump. Uh, one's operating at higher temperatures and pressures, one's operating at much lower temperatures and pressures. They're both handling fluids, they're both handling water, but operating at different parameters. So you have to understand what are the limits, what are the limiting factors on a coating? And the first limiting factor is temperature. In almost every instance, we're talking about polymer-based films. And any polymer will undergo a thermal degradation or thermal change in property. It, it will soften as temperatures increase. So as the temperatures increase, the material softens, the product starts to lose its mechanical properties. That could result in delamination or loss of adhesion. It could result in advanced loss of film thickness from erosive flow but the coating loses its mechanical integrity as it undergoes that thermal degradation. So if we know the temperature limit of a polymer and we can, clear, we can absolutely understand the temperature limit of a polymer by thermal testing, we can characterize a coating for almost any application. So I can, I, can, I can pick a coating that'll operate in a high pressure feed water pump. I can pick a coating that'll work in an acid dosing pump. I can pick a coating that'll work in an irrigation pump because I understand what the parameters are I understand what the polymer limits are. Okay, so that starts with temperature. Is that, you always start Tem with temperature? Always start with temperature. And then we go to solids content. Is this a clear water pump or is this pumping some kind of slurry? Is that slurry a suspended slurry or is it a settling slurry? What's the density of the solids in the slurry? What's the particle size range of the slurry particles? We want to understand what's the level of severity of the abrasive nature of this application. 
that will be an important. So if I'm pumping, if it's a wastewater pump, it's typically pumping organic waste, relatively soft. If it's a mine slurry pump, it's pumping a very hard abrasive particle. So the level of severity of abrasion comes into play. And I can choose my coating then based on the type of filler or reinforcement that I use. Chesterton uses a wide range of reinforcements, but for most of our abrasive surfaces, we use silicon carbides and aluminum oxide. Very hard manufactured minerals. These are materials with a mo hardness approaching diamonds. So they're extremely hard and abrasion resistant. And we will incorporate these into our coatings depending upon the severity of abrasive. If sometimes we're working in solutions that are 50%, 60% solids. There we use a very heavily reinforced material that's applied with a trowel. It's a very high build coating, a quarter inch or more thickness. When we go to water pump systems, we can go down to coatings that are a range of 20 to 30 thousandths of an inch. And these coatings are fluid. They're usually typically applied with a brush or spray. And these coatings tend to not use ceramic reinforcements. We move towards more flake reinforcements to provide permeation resistance. So if I'm dealing with abrasive solids, I'm gonna use ceramics. If I'm dealing with permeation effects and more corrosion effects, I'm using permeation resistant fillers. And after, after the- I'm curious, uh, go ahead. No, I'm saying, you know, so we got temperature, we have abrasivity, and the next thing we talk about is what is the chemical nature of the solution? Where is it on the pH range? Alkaline, high is 13 and a half, 14, acid down to pH of 0.1. Neutral being seven. Um, we find that corrosion occurs quite rapidly when the pH drops down below four. And this is on carbon steel. Obviously, if you go to hastaloids and titaniums and things of that nature, you can resist corrosion much more. But for mild steel, cast irons, you get below a pH of four and you start to see corrosion occurring. You get a pH um, above 12 and a half at high temperatures, you'll start to see corrosion occurring. So I can, I can understand if I have temperature, abrasive nature, and pH or chemical nature, those three characteristics can help me define what type of coating is gonna be useful. Okay. Um, so it made me curious, and I'm just wondering, have you ever had somebody kind of send you a project that a coding couldn't help with? And what, what do you do in that case? Um, well, we've had sometimes, you know, we've had applications where tolerances wouldn't be, where we couldn't meet the tolerance requirements. My coatings or some, some of, all coatings typically have a recommended functional film thickness range. Um, and for some of our highly abrasion resistant materials, the principle that we follow is the film thickness should be three, at least a minimum of three times the thickness or the three times the diameter of the largest particle of reinforcement. So we have reinforcements in our materials that are in the range of a 64th of an inch. So I have, my coating system has to be at least three 64ths of an inch as a minimum thickness. Sometimes they may only have two 64ths of an inch tolerance, so I have no way to apply my coating without binding or encroaching on those critical tolerances. In those instances, we have gone back to some customers and said, if you will trim the impeller back, we can, that will provide clearance. If you will route out the volute area, we can apply coating there, but if you won't change anything, then I tell them my coatings, while they might provide a protective layer, they can impact your pump performance. And that's a big issue is that most coatings manufacturers and coating applicators don't understand the impact of how a coating, what a coating can have on the critical performance of the pump. Where does it fall on its pump curve? So we're, we're luckily with Chesterton, we're, you know, we're very involved in the pumping industry. So we have a wealth of knowledge in pumping systems and I've availed myself of those experts, the Jim Moores, the Steve Bullens, the Marco Hansens, learned a lot about this industry, Ron Frassards. And so I understand, you know, what we, where we can and cannot encroach in a pump. So there have been applications where I've said, we just don't have the tolerance capability to apply the coating. There, uh, there have been applications where the temperatures or the abrasive nature is just too severe. Uh, one area, for instance, is the tar sands area in, uh, in Alberta, Canada. Uh, very, very abrasive slurries. Um, and they're just, they just tear apart 
the high chrome alloys in a matter of weeks. Everything. And, yeah, and a coating just can't last there. So, you know, if they, if they put a coating in, you might get 24, 48 hours life out of it. So it's just not economically viable. Um, we're doing, we're looking at one so, application uh, right now. We're looking at an application now that's looking at replacing, the, the client is saying he wants to replace his material construction from titanium to a milder alloy and use a coating to replace the corrosion properties of titanium. But he wants us to guarantee the coating for five years. And you know, we're now we're now we're getting into extremely detailed conversations about how we can or cannot do that. Yeah, I think you know, you have to really under you have to really understand the pumping system, what's going through there, what is it needed, um, you know, what how long it lasts, just I, how long is it in operation each day? I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of factors I would think that plays into that. Um, and, and of, but it's really interesting things, that you, you can apply it, right? You can apply it to any of these industries, any type of materials, um, yeah, and these, and these as long materials as you, can be you know, have to, that conversation with them. And these coatings can be applied to virtually any substrate as well. So we can apply them to cast iron, stainless steels, non-metallic. So we can apply them to fiber reinforced plastics. The only thing we really can apply them to are your ultra high molecular weight plastics, your PTFEs, um, the, those materials that you just can't get any bond to. But we've applied these materials to high chrome alloys, super duplex stainless steels, titanium, alloys, all grades of stainless steel, uh, and, and they perform extremely well. Well, I want to ask you your favorite project, if you can, if something sticks out in your mind uh, of something that you had that was one of your favorite, favorite projects. projects. Uh, well, in the pumping industry. Other than the shipbuilding, right? Because no. that sounded awesome. In, in the pump industry, I would say my, my favorite application was a large flood control project in Boston um, at, the, at the mouth of the Charles River, where the Charles River empties into Boston Harbor there is a pump station that's operated by the, um, the state and it's designed to pump the Charles River down if it reaches a flood stage. So they can pump the base, they just pump the Charles River directly into the harbor. And uh, that's to protect what we call the Back Bay area, which is the, where all the, the, the blue blood Bostonians live. And they, they spend their tax dollars, they want their, their residences protected. So we went into these, I went into this pump station, it was probably about 15 years ago to do the walk down before the application. I was completely unprepared for the scale and the size of these pumps. These were vertical turbine pumps that were rated at 750,000 gallons a minute. Each one was driven, there were six of them, each one was driven by a 1200 horsepower diesel electric motive that came off of a train. The pump barrels, were 18 feet in diameter and 37 feet high. You could drive a semi truck through these things. And they had six of these pumps. And we were, we were part of the coatings progress that we, we, were, we were actually lined four of the six pumps. And it was, one, it was fascinating because it, it was a hometown job. I lived just north of Boston. Uh, two, it was really fascinating because the, the people who were doing the application had never worked in a pump application. They'd done tanks, they'd done pipelines, they had never done a pump and they were terrified of doing pumps. They said, listen, this is like no pump you've ever seen. This is like, a, you know, it's, it's basically standing inside of a, a chimney and coating it. Uh, and they did an excellent job and the coatings are still in service now. That's at least 15 years ago. Now, they have they Operated those pumps and they probably I think they, they check them once a year but we haven't luckily we haven't had a flood stage where they've had to rely on them. but the pumps are they're, they're turned on they're churned up once a year just to make sure they operate and uh, every year I get an inspection report saying the coating's fine so I'm perfectly happy yeah and that's what we need we have to have those um, things in place in case you need it uh, it's so important you know definitely right there along any water uh, I guess area. I don't know what to say about that, but d definitely in those areas where our population is so close to the water, um, I, and we'd have yeah. to have that backup. You think about Miami. You think about okay. New Orleans. 
Yeah, exactly. It's exactly where my head was at with, uh, you know, the largest wastewater station um, that I, you know, visited was in New Orleans and um, astonishing, right? I didn't get to see it installed, but, yeah. you know, just seeing that massive amount of water being pumped is, is something. Uh, so I, d- I do, I can imagine those guys kind of, um, you know, hanging around spraying or whatever they do uh, to get the coatings on to the pump surfaces. Um, so is it a spray or is it like a painting? Like how does no. that work? Well, it, you know, these coatings that we applied on those pumps were spray applied. So we use a, an airless spray system, which is very effect, very effective and efficient. So there's very good material transfer. You get virtually a hundred percent material transfer to the surface. So your waste is minimized. Um, luckily, our materials are very low VOC, so there's no volatile organic compounds. So they didn't have to worry about any kind of uh, flammability or explosive environments in these confined spaces. Um, and the material was applied. They were they were have, operating three guns, and they were able to coat one pump every three days. So we were doing. I think the total surface wow. area of a pump was somewhere around seventy five hundred square feet. I mean, I just think it's amazing of what we can do um, as humans. It's amazing. So anyway, um, just as we've been talking, Steve, is there anything else that you kind of want to leave our listeners with? Um, I definitely know your passion about coatings, and I love that. But anything else just for our industry people that you want to leave them with? Yeah. Um, you should consider always consider a coating as a, as a if not a first option, uh, as a strong option, because you have... The pump is a, is a mechanical device is going to be subjected to corrosion. There's no doubt or erosion. There's going to be a reaction with the environment. Over time, that pump will start to degrade. Um, reports dating back to 20 years ago were already classifying, saying the pump efficiencies in just clear water application, you can lose 15 to 20% of your pump efficiency in the first five to 10 years, just pumping clear water. So if that's the situation, how do we anticipate pump life over time? How do we protect our pumps over time? If we take no steps to protect the internal wetted surface areas, those hydraulic passages, the pumps are going to degrade. So you either upgrade your pump and spend a lot more money or oversize your pump and spend a lot more money, or you properly size and coat the pump. And that will protect that asset at a minimum, you know, depending upon severity of service, you can see 15 to 20 years in a clear water application. I've got numerous applications where our pumps, coated pumps are running 15 to 20 years with no service disruptions. To me, that's a very valuable coating at that point. That coating has paid for itself probably 10 years ago and it continues to provide value. Yeah, and I think we, yes, and we we definitely have to look at these sustainable options and things that can uh, really help our system stay into play um, and running up and running. Uh, And so I think this is another way, but you also talked about it kind of on that maintenance side of, okay, when you are maintaining the pump, let's go ahead and take a look at the coatings. Um, Maybe they didn't put coatings in first. So maybe they need to look at coating as a, an option. Um, So there's a lot of different ways we can look into that. Um, But if they need to, you know, know about coatings, now they know the person to come to, Steve. So Um, one of many. One of many. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I have some fun questions for you. You've already kind of told us this amazing way that you've gotten here to our industry. And I, that also in itself is, is just a testament to um, the pump industry as a whole. Like there's so many different backgrounds and people that, that come in here and make it very diverse and, and wonderful. But okay. So these are my rapid fire questions, Steve. So fire get ready. Away. Okay. Fire okay. Away. Well, first one is what's your favorite book? Uh, Shackleton. Okay. And, uh, I thought you were going to say something about coatings. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, and next one is your favorite song. Oh, uh, Melissa by Allman Brothers. And what do you wish that you could do? What do I wish that I could do? I wish I could know as much as I know now when I was 18 years old. That's such a great, great answer. Uh, my next question is just the best advice that you were ever given. Best advice I was ever given. Uh, 
the best advice I got ever got was from my brother. Uh, and he, he said to me, this was, uh, several years before he passed away, but he, he explained to me, he said, Stephen, you can do anything that you believe you can do. So don't listen to other people who say you can't. And I've heard things of that type from other people, but when he said it, it meant something because he actually lived that existence. I mean, he was told he couldn't do something and he did it anyway, and he excelled at it. Um, and when he said he could do it, I realized that I could do it. And that's what I've been doing ever since. All right. Last one. I know I said that was my last one already, but I have a, I have a question. So like, what is something interesting that people would know about you that you do? Something that's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I, in the, in the summertime, I have my own little ideas here of things I know about you, but yeah, uh, go ahead. in the summertime, I'm a lobsterman. I, I, I take a, I take a month's vacation. I love it. I take a month vacation and I go to a small island off the coast of Maine and I work for a friend who's an offshore lobsterman. And we're on the ocean every morning at 3.30 in the morning and we get back at 2.30 in the afternoon and we fish about 20 to 30 miles off the coast. And I do that for the month of, I love it. Month of yeah, July. So, well, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be here in July, but um, <laughs> we know lots of people take vacations. Uh, during July, but uh, we'll we'll be able to share that together. And I absolutely love uh, lobster roll from that area. I've had you a couple, it. so you got it. Um, send me your, your address. I'll send, send you. Send me your address. I'll air freight you some lobsters down. That's awesome. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your time today. I've enjoyed it and really uh, learned a lot about you that I didn't know your first story and of how you got here, and then just everything I need to know about coatings. Um, you're the guy. So um, Come on thank you so Charlie. much. And uh... Okay. We're back. Thanks everyone for sticking around. I hope you got just as much out of that interview as we did. Um, and let Chesterton know and let Steve know through social media that you really got a lot out of it or leave a comment on the YouTube if you're here so that they know what you liked about the interview. Absolutely. And that brings us to the end of the show. And thank you so much for listening. Do us a favor, subscribe, rate and review the podcast so that other listeners can find the show just like you did. And you can always reach us through social at Empowering Pumps and using the hashtag Empowering Industry Podcast, or you can email us at podcast at empoweringpumps.com. And we'll be back every Monday with a new episode. Until then, be empowering. Okay, here we go. It looks like we're recording now. Awesome. Bethany will be so happy we have something to edit on the front end. <laughs> <laughs>